Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another episode of Avatar The Legend of Korra. And we're now starting to get into the season. Things are happening, to say the least. Um, it's kind of debatable what you want to consider this. Is this the second episode or the third? It's actually the third, uh, because the premiere, of course, was two episodes back-to-back, -back, even though they weren't a part one or a part two. Rebel Spirits and Southern Lights... And now we have Civil Wars, Part 1. Which they show separately. It, that's kind of a weird naming convention. They really maybe should have done Rebel Spirits, Part 1, Part 2, as opposed to making the, you know... Makes a little bit more sense. You probably could have came up with these next two as her own titles. But we'll, we'll see how they transition as a story. Um, obviously, um, I still kind of feel that they pulled the heel turn with Korra's uh, uncle a little too fast. It still feels like maybe there should be more of a debate. Maybe there should be not quite the full presence of the Northern Water Tribe. Like, there's like some troops. Like, maybe make a ship or two. Later on, we slowly start to be, you know, maybe at the end of the episode, more ships arrive. You know, bring us this slow build. I really think they had uh, kind of blowed, blew their load a little too early with the Northerners, who, you know, this series, we've always treated them as a bit of bore. Being a bit stuck up, you know, prudish, all that stuff. So, it's kind of nice to see. It would, I think they would have... They kind of hit you too hard. Uh, real shameful, because I know they have more time this season. They have a lot more episodes they have to work with. So it really feels like they could have taken their time to build up uh, kind of a slower occupation rather than just one day, bunch of troops show up, take over. Uh, still didn't address the one problem I brought up is, you know, it's supposed to take place in the 20s. They don't have guns. I know it's Nickelodeon, but it just kind of looks a little ridiculous to see people with 1920s technology, and they're still, like, they're regular guys that aren't waterbenders, have spears. It, it's just disconcerting. They really need to make... Give the dudes something that looks steampunky, at least, or diesel punk weapon. You know, give, the electric ideal is really good. They all have electric guns, and if you're afraid of it looking too much like a gun, have it be like a proton pack from uh, Ghostbusters. You know, they have to wear it. It's almost set up more like a flamethrower-looking thing, so it doesn't quite look like a gun, if that's what you're concerned. Yeah, you can see you point it and shoot it, but it still looks different enough that you're not as worried. Something like that would would work, or you know, something a projectile. And hey, man, you can make cross cross market with Nerf. See, making you money. But yeah, uh, still, I'm still gonna harp on them for, for that because it's just, you know, I could buy, I, I could excuse it in the most part in the previous season. One, they did actually bring in some sort of electrical weapons into play. Uh, but two, they were dealing with cops and terrorists in the 20s setting, and I can see them not using weapons as much. You know, you have cops, and pretty much all the cops, because that was part of the theme, were benders. Oh, apologize for that. Anyway, let's let's uh, get into a little bit more of the actual episode. Of course, it call, it's called Civil Wars, and plural is the key there. There's three conflicts. You got the the Aang siblings, I guess we're going to call them. I guess uh, yeah, Aang never really got a last name last season, so... Or not last season, but uh, I don't think they would... Not, I'm not sure if everybody would just have a last name. But you have Tenzin and his brothers, they, they're at each other's kind of throats. He kind of showing maybe a little bit of the reveal of uh, Aang as a father. And maybe he did neglect some of his kids growing up. And uh, kudos to the writers for having a character and kind of pointing out 
you know, just by his nature, he probably messed up on things. Uh, maybe the kids, he didn't, he didn't spend enough time with his kids as he would have liked. And you see that after effects. A nice little, uh, writing there, and kind of taking a character that we know from this series so well, you know, from the original series, the main character, and, and pointing out some faults that might have happened later on. They're willing to re uh, kind of re do a little bit of a dig at their own guy, and uh, that shows some confidence as a writer. Um, we're, we're seeing how that progresses. Of course, they're still running around the Air Temple stuff. Um, you get some fun interactions there. Some interest, it's some good, interesting character development. Brings us a little bit into the Tenzin character, uh, a little bit of why he is different from his siblings, and also his sense that he's has had a weight put on his shoulders since he was the only one of Aang's kids that had airbending, that he was really the one responsible for an entire culture. That, I think, is an interesting reveal for him. And that might come into play later on. The ideal of a lot has been placed upon your shoulders when you were young. So I have a feeling that's going to come back into play. That that's that 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 is a key line. I'm betting, because of course you have that parallel with it's probably seeming like Cora is having her own culture put on her shoulders for her to for her to make it survive. So I guarantee you when he comes back that will, that's going to be an element to their relationship, this understanding between those two. Uh, back to the North, you obviously have Korra and her father continuing that debate, that debate their their arguments. Um, kind of her really no matter what the dad does, is, is they're frustrated with each other. Even when he kind of comes out to try to calm down the locals from starting a small riot with, or, you know, like a, uh, almost the setup of Boston Massacre situation, only, well, it turns out the crowd can bend water, so that makes things a little bit fair. Uh, it, you know, he comes out and backs up his daughter to try to calm everyone, try to stand in the middle. And by the end of the episode, they kind of work through that, which is kind of making me wonder what part two is going to be about, since they kind of, it seems they at least resolved Korra's civil war with her family. At the very end, they're brought together, they're, they're yeah, they embrace, they, they have seemed to come around. And then, of course, her uncle throws up and throws, and is going to throw her father in jail. Um... Yeah, of course, the developing situation with uh, Unalak and what he's doing, what his justifications are for basically occupying the South and his ideology. Uh, he at least they come up very clearly now with a much better reason for his ideology. You can kind of see what he's going at, and it what is kind of an oddity in the world of Avatar is that you have, and the, the worlds are basically divided based on the, the four nations, five now, I guess it's still technically four. Yeah, basically it's, you know, the earth, earth, fire, water, and air. Air has basically been wiped out, but it replaced it by that United Republic. So it's still four, but the water tribe, it is five, though, because the water tribe is split in two. There's a, the ones on the north and the ones on the south. And it's kind of weird how everyone else is kind of geographically together. Uh, well, I guess the air guys were kind of spread out in retrospect. But still, they, they were, were rather distinct, and you kind of wonder, I think they're going to go into a bit of the history there. And they're kind of, they're kind of laying out the... Uh, what everything was about when they when they mentioned the key to what that portal that Korra messed with last episode, oops, sorry, as I readjust, was about. Apparently there's another portal on the North Pole, and when these two are connected, uh, not only can you cross with the spirits realm very easily, people can cross almost instantly from the North to the South, and uh, Unalak wants this portal to be open, so basically Instead of a southern tribe and a northern tribe, there is just water tribe. 
to fully reunite, and I have a feeling we're going to get into a bit of the history of, okay, obviously this portal happened, people came from the north probably to the south, I think we're going to get a little bit of why, maybe why people left, why these two tribes split up at some point. Pardon me, as I uh, grab a drink there. So, no doubt, there's going to be a little bit into that, into the history. But you can see his ideology. He's got a clear ideal that there's this opportunity to unite our people. They, these are our brethren. And you can kind of lay out that he really plans on eliminating the Southern Water Tribe as an entity. It's going to be part of the Northern Water Tribe. In fact, there won't be a Northern Water Tribe. It'll just be Water Tribe. That's his goal, and you can understand that idea of uniting your people. Do you view again? This is a, a great pulling from history of that time. This is the same time period. Remember, it's basically 1920s in a fantasy world, martial arts fantasy world, with the bending and stuff. But it is basically that 20s period, and you have, of course, the anarchists that we dealt with last season, and now we kind of see the right. You see the rise of the nationalistic forces that were occurring during the 20s. Like the Nazis, specifically with their idea of Lebensraum. And more to that, the ethnic Germans that were outside of Germany. And one of the reasons they, why they wanted to expand Germany and take over all this territory was to bring all the German people and everyone they saw as German under one nation. So the Germanic, ethnic Germanic people living in Ukraine would be brought under the German nation, the Reich. People, yeah, that's why we see stuff in the Sudetenland, Anzlach, uh, Anzlach and Lorraine, all these little territories, and that was not unique to Germany. You saw equal movements in Italy, uh, to a degree Yugoslavia, uh, the Russians, that was always been a long-term goal is to bring their people, I mean, this is especially World War One, which if again we're looking 20s, this is right after the Great War, which one of the huge driving forces was of that war was ethno-nationalism. Um, yeah, it's a, it's very interesting how they see that. And that what ethno-nationalism -natu not only means maybe breaking up countries, but also expanding others because those people are like us, therefore they should be in the nation with the rest of their people. Interesting stuff, I think. That's what I'm pulling from it. Anyway, but yes, you, you kind of get it. He kind of lays out that's his ideology, and that he wants the the Southern Water, the Northern Water Tribe Army, there to protect the portal because it's in danger. Again, I, I lay out that they could have brought this as a bit of a slow. You have one battleship show up, and you're like, why are there uh, troops there all of a sudden? Okay, now they they kind of just have forces at the, you know, maybe the main palace there, and you kind of see maybe through these two episodes, maybe it would be nice if you saw a slow build-up. You know, maybe midway through the episode, there's another ship here now. Oh, yeah, yeah, we wanted, you know, some backup. Get the idea that you're having a slow build-up. Maybe make Unalak a little bit more questionable. But they at least throw some things in. Uh, there is an attempt on him as, a, as a basically another terrorist group forms. Uh, against the Water Tribe Occupation Forces, as it will, even though it has, it's kind of iffy how that works out right now. But they uh, they attempt to they basically kidnap him. Uh, Cora averts it and is, assumes her father was part of it, but as she finds out, after she defeats him, her father was not. He had refused to partake in this attack, and he said no matter... Later on, when he when they talked, of course, he reveals that no, no matter what, Unalak is his brother. He would never actually try to harm him. And afterwards, yeah, you know, Unalak wants to throw them, you know, just throw them in prison and be done with them. But Cora then looks like she comes with the bounce and goes, no, 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 they should have the right to go on trial. 
So he goes, and he agrees. So you do have them working a little bit with that. Okay, he's floating between the two. But then again, there's also scenes where he's this, the only person sitting in a giant throne room on the throne. Doing his emperor moment as he just sits there. Uh, yes. You might as well have done that. Yeah, they they got of course throw stuff in like that because you know as soon as more than any character moment though, when you see someone do that, you go villain. It doesn't help that he has an entire fleet in there. I still say that you know again, and I know that the reason I kind of keep on harping on this is because I know the writers are competent enough to pull this off that they could have done the slow build with it to kind of make it more of a back and forth. Are the Northerners being unreasonable here? Okay, first it's a few troops, but okay, these guys had to deal with a riot, so yeah, the Northern needs to send more. You kind of see what I'm going? It would have been a much more interesting build, but we'll, again, we'll see how it goes. Uh, interesting then, again, we're at the end where he... Of course, another civil war between the two brothers... Unalak and Ton, uh, Tonrak, where he kind of shows up at the end, even though, and arrests Tonrak, which again I think might be making him too much too much of a heel turn. If you're if you don't want to go to that full length, he's bad. Now, I'm kind of saying all this, assuming the rest of the this season is going to really be about this civil war. It could be the spirit situation really takes over after a few episodes. So we, we do have a bit to sit back and go, okay, let's see how this goes. But, uh, I don't know. We, we, we'll find out. I think they maybe are, they might be pushing too fast. I have a feeling, though, at some point we're going to have a real slowdown. I mean, we know we got at least two, three episodes of uh, Wan, uh, Wayne. Wan, I, I don't know how they're going to pronounce that. I didn't hear it pronounced in any official way. It's W-A-N. I'm assuming that's Juan. But uh, Steven Yeun's character, the first Avatar, we're going to have a couple of episodes where it's just that. And I have a feeling, of course, Korra is going to be going over to the spirit realm. Which, by the way, we haven't seen any of the spirits this episode. So their presence has taken a back seat. Probably purposefully. So that we get a sense that maybe the information that Unalak has been giving Korra is good. We'll find out. Anyway, um, it's 17 minutes on a 30-minute episode. So I think I've talked quite enough. Um, be interesting to tune in for next week. Uh, the, the ratings have been low, and I will uh, we'll talk about this be real quick. I mentioned it quickly in the last episode that our last review I did because I'd caught it a little late that the, the, the ratings have been marked as low about half of what the premiere was for Legend of Korra At, I forget when Legend of Korra premiered I believe it was in the spring so that might have something to do with it I, I also feel they really messed up with the scheduling Friday evening like okay this Friday I wasn't doing anything last Friday I was doing something so I didn't watch it I think it's just a really bad time slot that they they had moved it to Saturday morning works. I think the best for both the kids and adults. Because people will do stuff on Friday evening, especially in September. Like, maybe Friday evening might be okay later in autumn. But, you know, I have my window open. It's nice. It's still nice and warm here. So, I might go out and do stuff. Um, kids, even though they're not in high school, if, you know, Nick's aiming this at the 10-year-old demographic, their brothers might be, and so they might be going to a football game that Friday evening. For the adults like myself that watch it, you know, we also have adult lives, too. Um, if it wasn't for the fact that half the Seaside Boardwalk burnt down, I would say there's no, plenty of places to go on a Friday night. Uh, especially when it's still nice and warm out. So I, I have a feeling a lot of the... Well, two things. One, I really don't think they... 
I did not see the same media spam that I saw for season one, for season two. So I do think they messed up on that. And I think the time slot's bad. I guarantee you're going to see this time slot change at some point. Friday evening, it does not work. Saturday morning, come on. Saturday morning cartoons are classic. I know. Animation, we'll call it. By the way, I'm waiting. For anyone asks, I'm not saying. I have an opinion on is Avatar anime or is it not anime? I have an opinion on that. I'm really just kind of waiting to if I if I do an actual video scripted thing, it's gonna be that. I, I probably have to write it out. I've got to get the camera together. I've got to got to get backup information because if I do that, what is and what is Avatar? Is it anime? Is it not? I want to have it well researched. Because a lot of people just shout it out. And if I'm going to say what my opinion is, I'm going to have a hell of a lot of stuff to back it up with. And it, it involves researching, like, what does anime mean? What is anime? How do you interpret it? Why do we call anime anime as opposed to just Japanese cartoons? Stuff like that. It's it, you got to get into it very in-depth. And if, if you think that's a lot, there's a reason I went to grad school. <laughs> Anyway, I digress, as usual. Uh, so, I, overall, it's setting things up. It's it's getting it's a getting the plot together episode. There was a little bit of excitement. It's a middle-of-the-road episode right now. We'll see how part two plays itself out. But uh, it is really much... Okay, let's, let's get the engine running on the main plot. Uh, we had a lot of we had some fun in previous two episodes. There was some fun stuff. Uh, I think the thing with the cousins is getting a little they're creepy, but now they're kind of creepy to the extreme. But we'll we'll see how that all runs. Uh, poor Bolin. Um, and Mako's is kind of sitting there. Mako. Mako didn't really do anything much this episode. But, you know, you got a lot of characters. They can't all be front and center every single episode. But hopefully they, they start to balance this out a bit. Especially since you basically had the entire cast from last season plus an equal size cast from the pre for this season. And they still haven't introduced one of two of the main big characters for this season. Anyway, if you like the video, please subscribe, like, share... If you didn't, please subscribe, like, and share, because I could still use the stat, bos stat bonuses. <laughs> uh, please feel free to leave a comment whether you agree, disagree, think I'm a nut job. If you want to post a link to the Fox with the Foxes video, I don't know. I can't control the comments. So feel free to comment. I'm kind of repeating myself at this point. It's a little late because I waited a couple hours to actually do the recording. I'm, I'm signing out, guys. Night.